first of all, uh, a question: What do you think if Pele, uh, Tsik, or even Pushkash uh, play nowadays? Uh, should there a star as before, right now? Uh, I, I think the stars of the past, if you if you transplant them to the present, mm. yeah, the the reason that they're stars is that they you know, they have great technical ability, which is a physical thing and also a mental thing. And my suspicion is that the stars of the past would would adapt very easily to the modern game. Um, the only slight doubt is physical fitness, and obviously you have to be absolutely uh, committed to training now. You don't get players who are the, the shape of Pushkas. Uh, the Pushkas would not get away with eating as, as he ate. Yeah. Um, but I, I kind of think you, the, the nature of football is that the environment in which you grow up, even as a young player, would it would be that you're you're used to getting your diet right, getting the nutrition right from an early age. So um yeah, Pushkas would have been a different shape had he played today, but I still think he'd have been a been a great player. Um and maybe we went through a phase say ten to fifteen years ago when uh pure technical ability became less important, that it became about physicality, muscularity. Um but since the changes in the offside law, um, which has been an ongoing process since since the end of the 1990 World Cup, so the, the offside law has gradually been liberalised. So rather than getting both teams pressing up, playing with a high line, and the effect of playing area being you know 30 to 40 metres either side of halfway, which makes the game very congested and means that physical power, the ability to hold off challenges becomes very important, we've seen those lines go back and back and back because you can't play an offside trap now in the way that you could in the 80s. So that has allowed a, a, a smaller type of player to, to flourish again. And I think you can say Barcelona's success of five to eight years ago, players like Xavi would not have coped in the, in the mid, mid to late 90s, but the change in the laws have, have allowed him to, to flourish. So I think, we're, we're, um, I think we're back in a situation now where it is about, yeah, it's about physical fitness, but it's mainly about mental sharpness and, and technical ability again. Uh, on your uh, book, uh, Inverting the Pyramid, uh, you have a quote from Giorgio Valdano. Uh, it's just, uh, we see the mystery of football through cameras and TV interested just in activity, the game getting more intensive. If we don't play so intensive in a game, the views will use the remote control and switch the channel. So what do you think about? Yeah, I, I, mean, I think he, he does have a, a point. I mean, I think as Valdano often does. Yeah, he, just, just, uh, just uh, uh, my uh, question. We, we wouldn't use my question. Oh, okay. So, so, so you, if you yeah, can, uh, um, so, okay. Yeah. Um, I mean, Valdano makes the point about the, the television's need for, for perpetual action yes. uh, that, that viewers um, may turn off if, if you don't have yes. this, this constant motion, constant action. Um, and I, I think, as with a lot of things, Valdano exaggerates the point, but I, I, you know, I think it, it's it's true that the, the, the way that football is now consumed um, ha, has changed uh, the the priorities, that when people would just go into the stadium, I think the result was, was the key thing, that you went and supported a team and you would go home happy if your team had won, and you didn't really care how that had come about, because your experience is that 90 minutes of tension, who's going to win, is it my team, is it the other team? When you're watching on TV, you probably you, you get viewers who are less emotionally attached to the teams involved, and as a result, they what they're looking for is spectacle. They're not they're, they're not just concerned about who wins; they want to be entertained. And I think that does change the nature of of the sport because teams now clubs have to appeal to to the widest possible market. You know, you have to be able to sell cable TV subscriptions if you want to survive as a club at the top level. And so you have to make your style of football attractive enough um, that the people want to watch. I, and I mean, Valdano, his point about constant action, you, I, I'm not, I'm not fully convinced by that. I think people quite like languid teams, teams who, who you know, who sit back and stroll through games. Um, you, not everybody has to be like Chile. So you know, you don't have to play Marcelo Bielsa's football to attract viewers. You, you can. 
you can do it in a in a calmer way. But then you look at the criticism, say Spain had when they were winning, well, probably not the first European Championship, but the second European Championship in the World Cup, and people said that was a boring kind of football because they held the ball, it wasn't dynamic. Um, do Spain care? No, because they've, they've won two European Championships in the World Cup. Do Spanish fans care? Probably not. Uh, there's fans in, in other parts of the world who, who enjoy that style of football. Uh, but I think for, for a club side, that does become important because marketing outside of your traditional fan base has become so much more important. And what do you think about internet? So internet uh, and gambling, online gambling, can also a little bit uh, change the way how we uh, know football? I, th I think the the way the internet, or the way we consume football through the internet, it's, it changes our understanding uh, in a couple of ways. Um, there's a proliferation of statistical uh, information now that we didn't used to have. Um, and yeah, some people use that for gambling, some people use that because they're interested in it. But we, you know, we, we know now as the game's going on, we know how far a player's run, we know how many touches he's taken, we know how many passes he's misplaced. And that information, I think, if used properly, which is not an easy thing to do, and I, I think football actually has proved quite resistant to statistical analysis, um, but that information means players can't hide. Um, and Valerie Lobanovsky is one of the first people to, to really use statistical uh, data um, in, in training in terms of team selection. And players who played for him said, you know, going from another environment to play for Lobanovsky, you suddenly found the day after the game he'd be coming in with his printout of what you'd done in the game. And you couldn't have a lazy five minutes, you couldn't go and disappear on the wing and, and have a rest, because he knew. And that's just become more and more and more the case. So players are always being scrutinised. I think there is a danger with statistical analysis that um, football is very complicated, it's a very fluid game. Um, the, the nature of it makes it resistant to analysis. It's not like baseball or like cricket where you have you know, somebody throwing the ball at somebody else, a thing happens, it stops, you do the same thing again. You have these discrete moments. And so baseball and cricket are quite easy to analyse. Football, you, know, you can have the ball in play for two, three, four minutes at a time and everything is contingent on what went before. Um, so you don't have those fixed starting points which makes it that much harder to, to, to build up a picture of the game. And so you know, when Barcelona at their peak, everybody was obsessed by, by possession stats. And you know, how, can they, how can this team possibly win the game when they only had 36% possession? Well, possession doesn't win you the game. Scoring goals wins you the game. Um, but people were obsessed about that possession stat. Uh, or people obsess about uh, pass completion rates. Or oh, here's a player who's, you know, his pass completion rate is only 70%. Yeah, but what type of passes is he playing? If he's playing five-yard passes, you know, David Batty, the former England midfielder, he was just a destroyer in midfield, great at winning the ball back. But he also had great passing stats because all he did was pass the ball five metres to the player who actually play next to him. So is he playing that type of pass or is he, you know, like Michael Carrick, hitting 60, 70-yard passes out to the wings? Um, yeah, I think it's... The, the stats are, it's good to have them and it's, it, it informs our picture of, of, uh, of the game but we're still at a point where football is quite like, naive in its uh, use of stats. Uh, some months ago, I think in March, uh, it was a match between Liverpool and Manchester United. Uh, it's uh, just a quote from an English newspaper. English football's seven million pound match. There is a lot, lot more than bragging rights at stake for Manchester United and Liverpool. Sunday's clash will go a long way to deciding the Premier League top four. Thanks to TV money and gate re receipts, reaching the Champions League place will earn the victors at seven million pound cash bonanza. So what do you think if the risk is so big. Can or it changed also the game? So how the players are playing, how the tactics are, how the trainers uh, are going to a game. So it's it's unbelievable uh, big uh, risk on it. Um, I mean, we we're 
There's certain games uh, every season yeah. where a figure is put on. This game is worth this much. So games between you, you most typically hear this in in the playoff final to get promoted out of the championship into the Premier League, and it's yeah the forty million pound game, the fifty million pound game, whatever figure's been plucked out of the air. And of course, everybody knows that game is hugely important in terms of the the revenues that the, the winning club will get the following season because the you know in the Premier League. The TV money is is so huge compared to the Championship that it it yeah it, it's um, yeah you, you're talking about an income of a club going up by a factor of four or five. You also hear it with when you get a clash between say fourth and fifth, will they get in the Champions League? Um, now, I guess logically you'd expect the the pressure of, of that money to make the game more more tactically cautious. You'd expect. Uh, uh, an unwillingness to take risks, and yet actually, certainly the playoff final is almost invariably a really good game of open football. Um, that it, it's well, maybe the playoff final players at that level are inspired by playing at Wembley. That there's, there's still a, a sense of, of Wembley as something special. Uh, the players in, already in the Premier League maybe get used to it because you know, it's it's not. It's not as difficult to play at Wembley these days as it, as it used to be, but maybe in the Championship for those players it's still, God, I'm playing at Wembley, this is the home of football, this is amazing. And maybe that does inspire them. I, I actually think players, once they're on the pitch, they, I don't think they'll think about the money. Yeah. I mean, maybe maybe in relegation clashes it happens, when there's something to lose, the sort of, you know, most players have in, in their contracts um, clauses that say, if, if we get relegated, your weekly wage will be reduced by... 40%, 60%, whatever. So maybe in those games it, it has an impact. But I think, I'd, I'd certainly like to think that if you're a player in a playoff final, or if you're a player trying to get in the Champions League, it's a, you know once you get on the pitch, all you're thinking about is winning that game and, and about glory. Um, I, I find it a, a really, I find it hard to believe that players are more motivated by more money, you know, beyond a certain point. That obviously, if you said to me. Um, yeah, me as a journalist, I'll give you fifty pounds to write this piece, or I'll give you a hundred pounds to write this piece. I'll be more motivated for the hundred pound piece. If you say to me, I'll give you, you know, a hundred thousand pounds, or I'll give you one hundred fifty thousand. Yeah, that's still just an enormous sum of money, and I'm going to be equally motivated. So, I'd be, I'd be surprised if the amount of money makes a huge difference. What it, what it can do, of course, is create pressure. Around the club, so that you know, board members will know exactly what it's worth. People who actually follow the accounts, and maybe that filters through to the manager, which then filters through to the players. But I think it's a very indirect influence. Yeah, but uh, if you see once, maybe twenty years ago, it's more than twenty years ago, when Premiership started, the uh, earnings was uh, a weekly earnings was uh, ten times less than nowadays, and the general people, average people, earns maybe uh, doubled in this 20 years. Mm -hmm. So the gap between the players and the audience is is going to bigger and bigger. So what do you think about it? Can does it have an influence to a game or, or not? I think I think the biggest thing we've seen since the Premier League came in in terms of in terms of wages yeah. is. This huge gulf now exists between the people playing the game and the people watching the game, and that you know if you go back to the to the, even as late as the sixties, you have stories of the centre forward would get on the bus and he'd go to the ground, he'd play the game, and he'd get on the bus and go home, and fans would be with him on the bus. Um, now that's impossible now, um, and, and so you see players. I mean. Yaya Toure, for instance, his agent complaining that he's only making £220,000 a week when the vast majority of people who watch Manchester City might earn £220,000 in 10 years. Um, maybe maybe even longer. Uh, so, yeah, footballers exist in a completely different sphere now. I kind of think that the, that might have happened anyway because... Well, you know, I guess the process um, goes hand in hand, but the, the nature of who footballers are has changed. That it used to be completely possible for a kid you went to school with who was quite good at football to become a professional footballer. Um, 
Whereas now the Premier League, you know, there's only thirty five percent of players in the Premier League are English. Um, and so I guess the money draws in players from abroad. But the Premier League has become, you know, a global league that happens to be played in England. It's not not an English league in any real sense. You know, we haven't had an English manager win the league since what Howard Wilkinson in nineteen ninety two. So it's yes, yeah, twenty three years since an English manager won the English league. Um, Chelsea this season, you had John Terry. Uh, did you have any other English players who played regularly? Um, no. So you had one English player in the English champions, and you never have English managers. So it's it's not an English league. So that divide opens up between supporters and players because the players just come from completely different backgrounds, and I, I guess the wealth cements that that difference. And what you one of the reasons that a player like Juan Mata is is so popular is that he does mix with fans. You know, if you go on Juan Mata's blog, it's like a kid on a gap year. You know, he kind of goes around famous landmarks, takes pictures of himself. Uh, and he's, you know, there's an air of normality about him. But I think we've 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 come now to just accept that players live in this bubble, and they you know, they live in uh, their gated communities, and they never mix with with fans. And I, I think the game has lost something because of that. But it's it's an ongoing process we've kind of got used to. Uh, and so back to the TV rights and everything. So um, some maybe ten or twenty years ago, uh, in a Tournaments. I mean, in in the weekend there was uh, maybe matches on Sunday afternoon and Saturday afternoon. Right now, uh, a tournament on the weekend starts on Friday uh, afternoon until morning, uh, up till uh, Monday evening. Mm -hmm. So, could this change also the game, or it's it's a natural process? I mean, uh, also in in Spain, so uh, Real Madrid and Barcelona have to play on uh, noon because of the Asian uh, uh, viewers. Um, so, what do you think about the globalization? How is change or changing the the, uh, the game? Well, there's a lot of traditionalists in England who would still like the vast majority of games to kick off at three p.m. on a Saturday. Mm -hmm. That that's sort of seen as being the appropriate time for football. That's the holy time. Which is actually slightly ludicrous because if you look back through history, English history, games sometimes start at two o'clock, sometimes at two thirty. You know, in yeah, you know, before floodlights became common, so yeah, you know, before the Second World War, yeah. games started at different times according to what time of year it was because you, you had to have light. So games in in the middle of winter would start at you know one thirty, two o'clock because you had to get it over before four o'clock when when it got dark. But yeah, there's a, there's a sanctity about three o'clock on a Saturday, and. Yeah, you know, three o'clock on a Saturday. I mean, the, the reason that Saturday afternoons became the time when English clubs played was because um, when the Factories Act was introduced in, I think, eighteen eighty, um, it, it, you know, people worked five and a half days. They worked Monday to Friday and Saturday morning, and then on the way home from the factory, they went and watched the football, and then they went home to their families and spent Sunday with the families. And that was why football took off. It was, um, it just became. The, the routine of the working week was you went to football on a Saturday afternoon. Now that obviously doesn't apply anymore. So in a sense, that's you know, that, that model of working it doesn't exist. So so there's no real reason for it to be at three o'clock. Three o'clock is a very you know it's a good time and it works because if you're an away fan going to games, you have time to get to the game. without having to get up ridiculously early. The game finishes. If you're an away fan, you can you can go home. If you're a home fan, you know, maybe you go to the pub and have have. Yeah, have have lunch before you go to the game. Have a couple of drinks afterwards. You still have the evening. Um, so three o'clock on a Saturday kind of works, but we've got used to the fact that um, for for television that we have to spread the games out. Uh, and you know, there's, there's a problem, or maybe problem is the wrong word, but uh, three o'clock was convenient for fans who went to the game. Now we're thinking of fans who are watching on TV. And so playing games at lunchtime for in, in Europe for for the Asian market, um, I guess playing games later for the for the US market. Uh, you know, Monday night games are horrendous for away fans. You know, if if you're going from Newcastle or Sunderland down to Southampton, say, or even down to London, you're not going to get home from that Monday night game until four a.m. on the Tuesday. So it it's, it makes it very hard for for away fans. But you're talking about three four thousand people maximum. And I guess their needs now have um, been been overwhelmed by by the demands of the, the TV audience. 
Um, I mean, actually, something that I found really revealing in that regard, I was at a game between Tottenham and Southampton last season, um, and there was a uh, there was a, a crash on the on the on the motorway, and so there was a lot of congestion around the ground. And for safety reasons, the game was delayed because they didn't want people all rushing to the ground, you know, knowing it was a I think it was a three o'clock kickoff on a Saturday. So, yeah, at half past two, they decided, okay, we'll push back kickoff by half an hour. Everybody's got a bit more time. It'll be a bit calmer. You're not you're not going to have a you know a dangerous situation of everybody trying to rush at once, having come through this this uh, this traffic problem. And I looked at Twitter, and it was full of people in the U.S. complaining that the game had been delayed by half an hour because you know they'd arranged their day around watching it. And I was sort of initially I was sort of appalled by the um, what's the word the sort of self righteousness of I've paid my cable subscription, therefore this game should start when I wanted to over you know, the safety of people who are actually there. But then you think about, and, well, actually, that, that is the modern audience. The modern audience, your know, clubs make far more money from people watching on TV than they do from people going to the game. And we've almost reached a point where people at the game, they're, they're a useful backdrop. You know, they, yeah, the corporate boxes are important in terms of finance, but the people who go to the game, you know, if you, if you get a crowd of 40,000 and they're all paying, you know, 40 pounds on average, 30 pounds on average, you're only talking about 1.2, 1.5 million pounds, which compared to the, the TV money you get for that, is nothing. So, the, the way football is now financed, I guess inevitably the the rights of a TV viewer are increasingly taking precedence. Yeah, but in that way, the fans transform into consumers. So, the, a, a consumer is much important for a club than a fans. In that way, because of business. Yeah, um, yeah. Well, I think I think what we've seen is the the nature of fandom has changed. That yeah, you used to think of fans as being people who lived near the ground or you know, had a family connection to the club, and that, you know they went and it was somehow uh, an expression of their identity. And now you have you know, huge numbers of fans based all over the world who have no connection to to the club other than they they've picked them out for arbitrary reasons. That and it's a really odd thing you find on. Well, on on social media, that uh, you'll get really rabid Manchester United fans in Delhi or your Arsenal fans in Lagos. You're arguing kind of on obscure points of the club's history. You think, why? why you know, why why do you why do you care about that? Why? You know, yeah, yeah. I, I, I remember a discussion. You know, one of the reasons for the Liverpool Manchester United rivalry is the the Liverpool and Manchester were were two industrial cities. Um, who, yeah, 100, 150 years ago, had this enormous rivalry, and the dynamic of that was changed by the building of Manchester Ship Canal. That Liverpool was was a dock; it's on the sea. It had a huge advantage. You build the canal, and suddenly Manchester has access to the sea, and so that created a huge tension between the cities. And suddenly, you're finding, you know, fans of the two clubs in in Tokyo or you know, Buenos Aires, wherever, arguing about the Manchester Ship Canal. Yeah, wait, why, why, how does that affect you? It's got nothing to do with you. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of absurd even for people from Manchester now to argue about that because it's so long ago. But at least it is part of the, the, you know, their identity if they're from Manchester. But the fact that... Oh, you, you see it with Barcelona and Real Madrid. People arguing over what actually happened during the Spanish Civil War when they have no connection to Spain. It's a very odd, odd thing that you... When you pick a team, you somehow also take on... The, the team's history and their prejudices and their, um, yeah, their, their, their the minutiae of, of, of their, their identity through history. Yeah, but uh, also the owners uh, use in the same way. So it's the owner of, of uh, Chelsea has nothing, not any connection to, mm -hmm. to London. Or a lot of people abroad, uh, billionaires, who buying clubs from uh, Sevilla to Stoke City or, or uh, to Dagestan. So they don't have any connection. So they just... So what they see in football? Is it a profitable business? They want to uh, get some audience. So what do you think? So what they pick up clubs? I think the nature of ownership in football yes. has, has changed enormously. That certainly in England, traditionally, the club was owned by a local businessman, who, or you know, maybe three or four local businessmen who had money, 
and they like the the prestige that the the club gave them but and also you know they they sort of saw themselves as giving something back to the community from which they'd grown um and you got you got good owners and you got bad owners and still you have good owners and bad owners but now those owners um i i i mean i think we're down to seven british owned clubs in the premier league um not many anyway um, and the reasons those owners buy the clubs, uh, I think at the very top end you can make a profit. I think it, that is possible. It's possible. It, it's in the Champions League. I think it's it's possible to make a profit, um, especially with the with the TV rights deal as, as it now stands. I think financial fair play makes it easier to make a profit as well. That you're not constantly in this sort of arms race. That there's a sort of a, a cap being placed on that. Um, I think a, a lot of owners, I mean, I think you look at Randy Lerner at Aston Villa, Ellis Short at Sunderland, probably others, they bought clubs, um, Tom Hicks and George Gillette at Liverpool, although they've now gone, because they thought, you know, they, they thought it, it would be possible to make a profit in the future. They looked at a business that was not at that stage profitable, but they, they saw potential. Um, and I, I suspect that financial fair play and this TV rights, TV rights deal will make will make it possible to make a profit. In fact, the figures, financial figures for last year show it's the first year in Premier League's history that there has been a general profit in the Premier League. Um, that the clubs have, have managed to to take the money from the TV rights and not immediately spend it on players and players' wages. Um, so I, th I think it is, it is possible to make a profit. But I, I think actually for a lot of owners, certainly Roman Bramwich at, at Chelsea, it's about... Um, laundering his image, um, maybe maybe laundering is, is too negative, but it's about him promoting himself in a, in in the context of London. Roman Abramovich now is a not a celebrity as such because he's such a uh, a private individual, but he's somebody who is well known in England. And if Roman Abramovich was suddenly arrested by Vladimir Putin, there would be outcry in Britain uh, because you know it would just seem ludicrous to us. So what happened to Mikhail Khodorkovsky? Could not now happen to Roman Abramovich without a huge outcry. Now, maybe Putin doesn't care about that, but he's uh, he's certainly in a stronger position now than he was in 2004 when he, when he when he bought the club. And it's completely plausible now that Abramovich could settle in Britain, and nobody would think that was a an odd thing or a bad thing because mm. he's he's been around for for, for 11 years. So yes, yeah, self promotion, making yourself part of the part of the, the community of English football, yeah, you know, I can see why that's attractive to, to certain oligarchs. Um, I don't know why US hedge fund managers keep on buying English clubs, but I guess they, they see, well, they, they saw the potential for profit that's now being realized. But uh, in the day, just uh, transforming the clubs also, so they, uh, sometimes they change the colors of the clubs. I uh, mean, the Cardiff City, or the name of the uh, clubs, Hull City Tigers, or just uh, Red Bull, uh, uh, Red Bull Salzburg, uh, change also the colors. So they they coloring the traditions. I um, mean the uh, the sign of Real Madrid uh, lose the the cross on the top of because of the Muslim fans. So it's uh, still trans transforming uh, all the clubs because of the globalization. So what do you think about it? We used to uh, have this way of transformation of football. Well, there's been huge controversy in, in British football with yeah. over, over two two instances. The um, Vincent Towns ownership of Cardiff City and changing the shirts from blue, their traditional colours, to red uh, because you know, red's a lucky colour uh, in, in the Far East yeah. or, or you know, whatever. Um, which seems bewildering but I guess as an owner, that, that is his right to do it. It seems a strange, a strange business model to outrage your your main customer base, but that's what he's done. That's Milan at, at Hull City. I mean, that's that's a really strange case because he's not a foreign owner. You know, he's somebody from Hull, who you know he he knows the club, and yet he thinks it's more marketable as as Hull Tigers yeah. um, against the wishes of, of a fan base. Um, so I don't know f football. Is a strangely conservative sport that we you know, we love our traditions, 
and we sort of think of them as being absolutely immutable. Um, and I'm very torn on this. You know, part of me thinks, well, if, if that was my club, you know, if somebody took over Sunderland, the team I support, and said, right, instead of red and white stripes, you're going to wear green. Like, what on earth are you doing? We've always worn red and white stripes. But we haven't always worn red and white stripes. You know, we've worn red and white stripes since you know, 1890, but before that we wore blue. You know, and that, okay, that's not a great example because it's so long ago, but Leeds United in the early 60s changed from blue and yellow stripes to all white. And nobody really complained about that. Yeah, Don Revy wanted them to look like Real Madrid. That was his his specific idea. Was you will be more intimidating if you look like Real Madrid. Uh, when Bill Shankly was at at, um, at Liverpool, he changed them from white shorts to red shorts because he thought it looked more intimidating. Um, Arsenal have messed about with having white sleeves, not having white sleeves. You know, though those changes have always happened, um, but we seem to get more offended about them now. I guess changing the name of the club is a is a bigger issue. Um, but you know, it, it's not that this is an issue with foreign owners. These these are things that have always happened. And in the case of, of Shankly and Revy, they got it right. They won games, and so everybody quite happily adapted to it. Had Cardiff City suddenly got in the Champions League wearing red, I don't think Cardiff fans now would be particularly bothered by it. As it is, it was a, a you know the the change of colour of shirt was became sort of iconic of what they saw as Vincent Tan's lack of respect for the club, lack of understanding of what the club was, which is possibly true, but, um, you know, the owners do these things. Uh, and this is also a, a new thing uh, in football, so I just check how many times we have. Uh, the third part of ownership. It is also strange, so you have a club, you have players, but the right of the players have a not other uh, company who is maybe an offshore company we didn't know who is the owner of that company and uh, that company has an influence to the players so it's it's a little bit changed everything what we know about ownership of the clubs mm -hmm. about the community yeah in third party ownership has been banned in in england yeah. um and there's you know, huge problems with for instance Javier Mascherano and carlos tevez uh when when they arrived from corinthians to west ham and then when they moved on from west ham to well, to to, uh, to Liverpool uh, or into Manchester United, um, and I, I think yeah, you know, when you when you first hear the third party ownership, you can sort of see the logic of it that uh, as an investment vehicle, you can see it, it makes sense. Uh, if clubs have limited resources, it's a way for them to get a player without having to to make the full financial commitment to them. But I think it's it's hugely problematic because. Um, those players then become it becomes very possible to influence those players and you have these sort of shadowy outside figures who can manipulate results either directly through telling players to underperform, telling players to feign injury which certainly has happened in say Serbia um, or more simply just saying okay we're going to move this player from this club to this club and that that has a huge impact I mean you're seeing the negotiations now with um, with George Mendes at, at Manchester United, that it appears that there's a link between whether David De Gea stays at the club and whether Falcao stays at the club. That they're both George Mendes players, and Mendes would like a deal for for both to be done. So it's it may not be true, but certainly there's a perception that United have been pressured into giving Falcao a permanent deal in order that De Gea is not sold to Real Madrid. Now. If, that's not a healthy situation that an agent, an outside force, has that kind of that kind of influence. Um, you know, you, you saw it. You saw it Cardiff. Again, it, it may be completely innocent. I don't want to sort of. Um, I, you know, I don't want to make a concrete accusation, but Cardiff suddenly signed three Norwegian players when Ali Gunnarsson takes over. All players connected with his agent. Now, maybe he just wanted players at the club who who he knew players he thought he could trust but they had absolutely no impact on the season and inevitably then you start to ask questions well, why have they been signed where is the money that's being spent where is it actually going is that staying in football or is it being siphoned out to, to these third parties so I can see why it exists but I think it's a it's an unhealthy an unhealthy development what do you think about online sponsorship online uh, gambling sponsorship than online gambling companies are sponsoring uh, clubs. 
So they have also an interest. They we don't know uh, f uh, the ownership of them. A lot of them. Um, I mean, a lot of people have a huge problem with with gambling yeah. and and think it should just be banned. Personally, I think, and this is kind of my view on most things, but I think. In England, which is all I can really speak of, is the only thing I, you know, I know much about. Um, the presence of bookmakers who are properly regulated and very rigorous, um, what's the word? Uh, it's very, yeah, very rigorous regulation that the bookmakers undergo in England. Uh, and what that means is they they actually they they help prevent match fixing because they see immediately and then they they legally have to report any unusual betting patterns. So if they suddenly see an unusual amount of money going on you know, in a away team winning or a game finishing 2-0 or whatever, they have to report that. And so they act as a watchdog. So I, I think the ideal situation is you know exactly who the bookmakers are, they're properly regulated, and it's then not in their interests for games to be fixed. Because bookmakers make a profit by you know because the odds don't add up to one. So a fair game, they'll make a profit. The other way bookmakers lose money is if it's if it's fixed. So regulated bookmakers, I think, is the is the right way to do that. And uh, you know, the, the counter example um, in is, is 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 cricket, where cricket is massively popular in India, where bookmakers are not regulated and not legal. And Indian cricket is massively corrupt as a result because you have these non-regulated bookmakers who suddenly have a huge influence. Yeah, but in the world of internet, you cannot talk about regulated in, uh, bookmakers because so uh, I can bet on the internet uh, for a lot of sites in Asia. So they may have a regulation from Costa Rica, but you know this. Yeah, but but if you if you start betting on a on a Premier League game. Yeah with a Costa Rican bookmaker and there's an unusual amount of money going on that, that is still traced by British bookmakers. They, they would still see unusual patterns in the market and that allows them to act as a watchdog. So I, I, th I think gambling, you won't, you won't ever stop it. I don't think you should stop it. I, I think it, you know, in, for some people it adds to the, the fun of the sport. And what, why deny them that? Why deny them a chance to, to make money by, by testing their knowledge of what's going to happen? Um, I, I, I think it's a much safer world when bookmakers are regulated and illegal than, than when they're not. Uh, uh, what do you think? Uh, who, in the connection, just a very short question, in the connection of uh, football and money, uh, who has the reading uh, role? Football or money? So who is uh, the leader in that connection? So football has more influence or, or money? In what, sorry, in, what, in, in, uh, in the connection of uh, football and money. So it's a strong connection. Mm -hmm. uh, through TV rights, to internet, to sponsorship, to marketing and merchandising. Mm -hmm. uh, who is, is the leader in that connection? Football or money. So football is transforming money, or money is transforming football. Okay, yeah. Um, I think what we've seen develop over the last sort of five, ten years is is a handful of super clubs, uh, maybe six, eight clubs, um, and they they take that position by their financial power, and financial fair play reifies that. It makes it almost impossible for people to challenge that. So you know, we've seen that Barca, Real Madrid, Bayern always now get to the Champions League semi-finals. Uh, if you look, uh, I wrote a piece for the Guardian last year uh, where I, I, I traced the you know, rolling five-year periods. So um, if you looked at the semi-finals for Champions League, so five-year period, 20 places, how many different teams filled those places? So when football, you know, when the European Cup began, so you, you'd be looking at 56 to 60, uh, I think the figure was 13 or 14 different clubs filled those 20 slots. Uh, in the late 80s, when English clubs disappeared because of the high school ban, you're getting up to 17 or 18. What you have now is nine. The, over the last five years, there's only been nine different clubs in the Champions League semi-finals. And that shows that the money 
is is being routed to a, a small handful of, of clubs, and that is now their their wealth gives them a significant enough advantage that they habitually get to the the semi finals of the Champions League, um, and that I think has had a huge impact on the game. Um, I think it's a very dangerous impact that you look at the Bundesliga, and it's almost impossible to conceive a world in which Bayern did not win the, the Bundesliga. You know, they, they they haven't just won it the last two seasons; they've won it by by a mile. You know, they've won it by 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 April. Uh, Juve and Serie A the same. Um, Spain, at least you have two clubs, and occasionally you get challenges. In 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 Germany, you have Borussia Dortmund, but they can never sustain it because every year they lose one or two players who go. I mean, in, in their case. You know, it's, it's a uh, it's a doubly uh, it's a double problem in that they don't just lose the play, but the play goes to Bayern as a rule. Um, so they, they you know you may have one or two years where they can challenge, but you can't keep on regenerating when you're losing your best player, best two players every year, and you only have to make one mistake in the transfer market, as they did with Immobile, and yeah, they're, they're finished. Atletico Madrid again. I mean, winning the league last season was an astonishing achievement. But we've seen this season they, they haven't quite been able to sustain that and they lost, you know, what, three players to Chelsea? And and so Atletico will you know, they they'll drop back to their natural level, which is just below the elite. So yeah, Germany you have one super club, Italy you have one super club, Spain you have two. England we're probably slightly fortunate in that we we arguably have three, Chelsea, City and United. Um although Chelsea have run away with the league this year, I think that's a slightly I think there's specific reasons for that. Um uh, but then so that's an advantage to England in the sense our league is a little bit more interesting. The downside is it seems to have impacted on our Champions League performance and we didn't even have any quarterfinals this year. So this this generation of super clubs I think is is an enormous problem for football because if the domestic league becomes a walkover, what what's the interest in that? Why why do people still care about that? And I, I think there's a I don't I think it'd be a long time before it gets to, to, to this level, but I think we're we're nearing a situation that Brazil found itself in, that you had the state championships, which 20, 30 years ago were taken very seriously, and now they're a complete joke. You know, nobody plays their first team in the state championships because all they care about is national championship. And so it wouldn't surprise me if in five to ten years we you know, we see effectively a Super League of eight, ten top European clubs um, just playing among themselves because that's... Yeah, well, there's not much point if, if you turn up on a Saturday and the only question is, do we win four nil or do we win eight nil? You know, it's and that's what what a lot of La Liga feels like. It's what a lot of the Bundesliga feels like now. And just some uh, last questions: Why did you fall in love in football when I was children? Um. Uh, <laughs> Well, the, fir the first football match I went to was in October 1982, when I was six, um, and my dad took me along. Um, his mother, so my, my grandmother, lived about 200 yards from the stadium in, in Sunderland, in, in Roker. Uh, so I, I guess from a, a very early age, you know, when, you, when you sat in her front room, if the wind was in the right direction, you could hear the noise of the crowds. You, you knew what the score was just by being in her house. And she'd lived there well, certainly all my dad's life. Um, so my dad was a was a huge fan. His father had been a fan, but his father, had, um, so my grandfather, uh, he he was an engineer on a ship, so he was away a lot. So yeah, he he, he would go regularly when he was in England, uh, and he yeah he took my, my dad along, and then my dad took me. But I mean, I I, I guess I must have been badgering my dad to take me um, long long before that. Uh, so I guess it must just have always been on TV. Um, and I, I, I guess my dad must just have talked about it a lot. I, I, I mean, I remember whenever we went out on a Saturday as a family, we always had to be back in the car at twenty to five, so we got the scores. So wherever we were, whatever was going on, we went back to the car at twenty to five to turn on the radio. Um, I remember during the nineteen eighty two World Cup, so I was I was what f uh, five, uh, yeah, f five, yeah. I would turn six during the nineteen eighty two World Cup. Um, we were on holiday in Scotland, and um, my my dad, the, the the late kickoffs were too late for me to watch, but he'd write the score on a bit of paper and leave it by the side of my bed. So the, when I woke up the next morning, the first thing I, I did was yeah find out what the score was. So 
Yeah, I, 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 mean, I, I can't remember a moment where I suddenly thought, yeah, football's brilliant. But from the age of five or six, I clearly did think that. I mean, the first FA Cup final I remember was 1982, Tottenham QPR. The first European Cup final I remember was Villa v Bayern Munich, 1982. The first World Cup I remember was 82. So I guess, yeah, around about five, I had sort of a, a consciousness. And do you see that's the value? Uh, why do you <coughs> like this game still? Um, or it's changed? Like you changed, the football changed, or? Yeah, my, my, my feelings about modern football are quite, quite complex in that I recognise that the football we see in the Champions League now is the best football that's ever been played. You have this uh, concentration of the best players at a handful of teams like you've never had before and the result is occasionally absolutely brilliant football. So the first leg of the Barca Bayern semi-final I thought was absolutely sensational football. It was, you know, that game is one of the best 10 or 20 games ever been played I, I suspect. The technical level, tactical level, you know, it, it was just a, a fantastic game of football. Um, and so I admire that, I respect that, I, I enjoy that, watching that game, you, you revel in it. But I think there's also a sadness there that football's lost a lot of its community roots. That you know, when I first started watching Sunderland in, in the 80s, well, I guess there's, there's two things. One is that there was a, a handful of players in that Sunderland team who were from Sunderland, you know, who'd grown up with the club, who, you know, their dream as kids was to play for Sunderland, and there they are playing for Sunderland. Um, and that idea of a, of a local hero. I mean, Harry Kane at Tottenham, one of the reasons he's so popular is that he is a local hero. You know, he, he's from four miles away from, from, uh, from White Hart Lane. Um, but that's incredibly rare. The reason Steven Gerrard was so popular at Liverpool is that he, he's local, and that's very, very unusual. Um, and I suspect it'll become increasingly unusual. Um, so I think there's a sadness there. But also, you know, when I, when I was a kid, um, I'm talking sort of age what, 13, 14, I went along to Sunderland every week and I paid £2.50 and I could have, you know, £2.50 was completely affordable for me. Like now the cheapest kids tickets are, what, £20, £25? You can, I don't see how they can afford to do that every week. Um, and so you know, when I was at school, I went to school in, in Newcastle, although I lived in Sunderland. Uh, so I was a Sunderland fan, I'd go and watch every Sunderland home game, but I'd also go and watch Newcastle ten times a season. Because I had friends who supported Newcastle, so they'd come and watch Sunderland, I'd go and watch, watch Newcastle with them. And I could do it because it was affordable. And I think there's a real problem that in, certainly English football is storing up for itself, that the, the age of the people in the, in the grounds is increasing. So you're not getting a, a young generation coming through for whom going to football is a routine that, that's just part of their week. And that, I think, is very sad. That um, I saw a survey four or five years ago that... Manchester City looked at the average age of their season ticket holders and over the course of a decade the average age of their season ticket holders had gone up by eight and a half years. It's, just, it's the same people who are going. They're not getting a, a, a new generation. Um, so that I think is a is a problem football needs to address. That I, I, I guess it comes back to, to television that the way most kids consume football now is, is through TV and going to the stadium maybe is not quite such a a regular lens it was it was it was to me in my generation.